Well, good morning, folks. Our study today, the title will be Humanity at the Cross. But the, the real study is uh, how the cross of Christ has saved us, saved the human race of our sin problem. And to appreciate this study, it is extremely important that you understand the sin problem because you know, most Adventists have a limited understanding of the sin problem. And that has led, at least it's one of the reasons why it has led many of our people to be trapped into legalism. When you realize our total depravity, you will realize that the only hope of salvation is in Jesus Christ and that we can make no contribution. So I'm going to give you uh, in the Old Testament, there are some 12 different words for sin. In the New Testament, that is in the Greek, is five different words. But when you put them together, you have eight different categories of sin. And I will mention that to you. I'll give you some text. You can read at home because we don't have time to read it here. But you need to come to grips with the sin problem. Christ has redeemed us from the six problems of sin that are related to the law. There is one sin he did not die for. It's called the unpardonable sin. And you're wondering what that is. Well, I will touch it also. Okay, so if you have a pen and pen, write out the text, okay? Uh, the first one you are all familiar with. Sin is the transgression of the what? A deliberate, a deliberate sin against the law of God. Now, the King James says what I just quoted. Sin is the transgression of the law. The original doesn't say that. The original says sin is lawlessness. And lawlessness is a person who deliberately chooses a life of sin. Okay. That's number one. Of course, that's 1 John 3, 4. The second definition of sin is a mental consent to a temptation even though you do not commit the act. Because the law doesn't only demand perfect performance it demands perfect desires so Paul explains in chapter 7 of Romans verse 7 to 11 that he did not know sin until the law said thou shalt not covet and he realized as a Pharisee he did not do the acts but he was full of sinful desires you can also read Matthew 5:27 where Jesus said, if you look at a woman to lust, even though you don't commit the act, you have already committed what? The adultery. So when you realize that, you will say, who can be saved? Number three, and that gets even harder, neglect of known duties or opportunities is sin. And all of us are guilty of that. And the text that you want to read is James 4 verse 17. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is what? Sin. Oh boy. Now comes number four. Doing the wrong thing out of ignorance. Oh boy. That is sin also. And you find this in Leviticus 5 verse 17 to 19. You're doing the wrong thing. You don't know you're doing the wrong thing, but in God's eyes it is what? Sin. Can you see how terrible sin is? Number five, and this is one you need to take note of. Anything that we do, any good thing, any right thing, keeping the law, we do for the wrong reason or wrong motive is sin. You know, in Matthew 7 and verse 22, 23, people will come to Jesus in the judgment and say heaven we cast out devils in your name and did many wonderful works in your name and Jesus will say I don't know you you who commit iniquity which is one of the words for sin that's Matthew chapter 7 verse 20 and 23 by the way Isaiah 64 verse 6 says basically the same thing that all our righteousness not our sins our, our righteous our filthy what Rags. In, in Zechariah, filthy rags is equated with iniquity. Now, number six. Number four, you want the text or the sins of ignorance? Okay, it's, it's Leviticus 5, verse 17 to 19. 
<laughs> you mean neglect of known duties? Okay, since he's about my age, I'll let him have it. James chapter 4 verse 17. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is what? Sin. James 4 17. Now these five definitions of sin that I, first, I gave you so far has to do with our performance. It's either by word or by thought or by desire or by act. And when the Bible talks of these five, it uses the word sin in the plural because there are more than one. But the next two, the Bible will use the word sin in the singular. Number six is our sinful natures that we have inherited from Adam. Now some of our people don't like that. So I'm going to give you a text. I'm going to read a text. Romans 5 and look at verse 19. And this text is dealing with nature. Romans 5, not performance, but our very nature. That is why folks, babies need a savior. They are born sinners. They may look beautiful in your eyes, but they are, in the eyes of the law, are sinners. Okay, chapter 5 of Romans, look at verse 19. And look at the verb tense, okay? For as by one man's disobedience, and who's that one man? Adam. Many, the Greek is the many, the human race, were made, past tense, were made what? Sinners. So you are a sinner and I'm a sinner from the day we were born. And I'll give you some more text on that. But I would also like to read the second half because this verse is dealing with nature. Please notice the verb tense of the second half. So also by one man's obedience. Who's that? Jesus. The many or many will be made, future tense, will be made what? Righteous. Because our nature doesn't change when you accept Christ or at your conversion. It is only at the second coming of Christ, which is future, this corruption will put on what? Incorruption. So stop looking at yourself for acceptance before God. God accepts you in Jesus Christ. In Him, we are saved from the guilt and punishment of sin. We are saved from the nature of sin. And we are also saved from the, you know, all these other seven uh, 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 categories of sin. Our performance as well as our nature. And of course, Jesus took to heaven a glorified body prepared for you and he'll give it to you at his second coming. Here's a couple of more texts. Psalms 51 verse 5. David says, I was shapen in iniquity from my mother's what? Womb, oh dear. And chapter 58 of the same book, Psalms, and verse 3. You know, I once spoke in New York, and one young guy uh, who belonged to the independent ministry said, no, no, no. What David is saying is that his mother committed adultery. In that sense, he was born in I said, where did you get that from? So I made him read Psalm 58 verse 3, which makes it much more clearer. You know, and he read it and he was, he didn't know what to say. Folks, we are sinners by nature. Now there's a seventh sin, and that is something you also need to know. Sin is a law, a principle, a constant force that dwells in our human nature which makes us slaves to sin. And Paul deals with that, you know, in uh, Romans 7 verse 14 to 24, you know. He says, I want to do good, I delight in the law of God, but I don't do it because there is the law of sin in my members. And twice, in verse 17 and verse 20, he says, It is not I that am the culprit because I have a converted mind. I don't want to sin. But sin, singular, that dwells where? In me. He's not talking, he's talking about a force, a power, which makes us a slave to sin. The last... Okay, it's Romans 7, 
verse 14 to 24. In verse 14 he says, the law is spiritual, but we are carnal, sold as slaves to what? Sin. So that in and of yourself, even after conversion, you cannot obey the law in God's eyes. Thank God we have the Holy Spirit. So that we are able to do what the flesh is not able to do. You know, and keep that in mind. So please remember, sin is a big thing. But thank God, all these seven categories of sin was taken care of at the cross. And I will share this with a moment. But as I mentioned, there is one sin. There is one sin that Jesus did not die for. It's the unpardonable sin. And many people are confused. What is that sin? And they come to a wrong conclusion. Okay, it is, the, it is the sin of unbelief in terms of the gospel. In other words, unbelief is a verb. It's a deliberate, persistent, and ultimate rejection of Jesus Christ after you have been convicted by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So I'll give you some text, you know. In John 3, we know verse 16. We know verse 17. But if you read verse 18, Jesus says to Nicodemus that those who believe will be saved, but those who do not believe will still remain condemned and then he gives the reason because they do not believe in the only begotten son of God then in chapter same chapter, chapter 3 verse 36 Jesus is talking not Jesus but uh, John the Baptist is talking to the Jews and he says if you reject Jesus your Messiah the wrath of God still remains on you and then of course in Matthew 2 12 verse 30 to 32 Jesus defines this sin as the sin against the Holy Spirit because he's the one that convicts you of the gospel but let me give you one more that is very confusing to many Adventists Hebrews 10 verse 26 if you sin deliberately after you receive the knowledge of the truth there is no more sacrifice if you look at that sin in the context he is not talking of any sin you commit against the law it's a sin against grace especially verse 29 it makes it clear you have rejected the only sacrifice that saves you in verse 14 of that chapter we are told that by one sacrifice that is the cross God Christ has redeemed us fully and completely from the sin problem but if you reject that sacrifice, that one sacrifice, there remains no other sacrifice for your sin. Now he's writing to the Jews. Your morning and evening sacrifices, the sacrifice for the day of atonement is valueless because animal blood cannot cleanse you from sin. Okay, now, just one word about sin in the singular. John chapter 1 verse 29. John the Baptist introduces Jesus as here's the Lamb of God that taketh away what? Singular. Because our sins don't make us sinners. Our sins only prove that we are sinners by nature. Tell me, if you have an apple tree, and this is Washington, you know, goes the best. everywhere in America, it's Washington apples. Even in D.C. <laughs> If you have an apple tree that produces very sour apples, if you remove all the apples, have you solved the problem? No. Next year he'll produce some more sour apples. The problem is not with the apples. The problem is with the what? Cut it down, folks, and plant a new one. And so our problem is not what we do or what we desire or what we consent to. Our problem is we have a nature that is sold under sin. Romans 7, 14. So Paul will say in Romans 3, verse, verse 9, that both Jews and Gentiles are under, ruled by sin. And by the way, Ellen G. White calls this indwelling sin. That's what she terms it. Indwelling what? Sin. Okay, now, how did the cross save us? From all this okay it's very important to know number one 
Now, by going to the cross as the power of God unto salvation, we must be clear that the death of Christ on the cross was a corporate death. You see, the Christian church, uh, based on the doctrine of substitution, has been teaching that Jesus died, one man died, in the place of all men. And this doctrine has brought us under tremendous fire by the non-Christian religions, especially the scholars of Islam. They accuse Christianity of legal fiction. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, if you look at Deuteronomy 26, no, sorry, 24 and verse 16, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 16, you will discover that the law of God does not allow an innocent person to die in the place of guilty person. You'll find the same thing in Ezekiel 18, verse 20, which is a conclusion of what he began in verse 1. The father cannot die for the sins of the son and vice versa. The soul that sins, it must what? Die. So before God could save us through Christ, he had to qualify Christ legally to represent us. And I already ex explained that in a previous study when I gave you the two words, bios and zoe. In the incarnation, God took the divine life of Christ and our corporate life, because we all share the same life, we are the multiplication, and joined them together in the womb of Mary. So the word, which is God, became what? Flesh. So he was God and he was man. And this is a very hard concept. How can one person be two people? So the Christian church argued about it. And finally they met together at a council called Council of Nicaea and they agreed that he was God and he was man. Do you think that solved the problem? No. They came up with a new problem. How much of him was God and how much of him was man? 50-50 and so on. And they argued another hundred years until they came to the Council of Chalcedon and they said, yes, he's 100% God and 100% man in one person. We can't explain it. The Bible says so. We accept it. And this has become part of the Apostle Creed. Now, the, the union of divinity and humanity did not save us. It qualified us, qualified Christ to be our Savior. That is why Sister White says the humanity of Christ is everything to us. That is why Hebrews 2 verse 17 says, In all points he had to be made like unto his what? Brethren, please notice. The divine nature belonged to him. That was his by native right. The human nature that he assumed belonged to us, but he assumed it in order to save us. And I need to explain that because I've done it once, I'm going to do it again because that is where the problem is. Let us say one of you has a brother or sister or daughter or son in Salem, Oregon that is struggling financially. So you come to me with an envelope with $500 in it. And you say to me, can you please deliver this to my son or to my daughter when you return back to Salem? Because that's where we live. And I said, sure. I take the envelope and I put it in my what? Pocket. Now, in whose possession is this envelope? In my possession. Does it make me a robber? No. Yes, if I kept the money, I would be a robber. But even though it is in my possession, I have assumed that envelope in order to deliver it to the person living in Salem. So also Christ assumed our humanity to redeem us from both categories of sin. The first five and also the last two. He could not save us by proxy in terms of our humanity, in terms of our nature. He had to execute that. Okay? But now, let me, and because of this, a very famous uh, French theologian made this statement. He said, every born-again Christian is born crucified. 
and he based it on Galatians 2 20 where Paul says I am crucified with who but I'm still living it is not I but who Christ so when you accept Christ and are baptized into Christ you are identifying yourself with his death and Romans 6 verse 2 says how can you that died to sin say it is okay to sin and in verse 10 Paul says that Jesus died to sin once and for all and then in verse 11 he says likewise consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God and a dead person cannot choose to live a life of sin am I correct yeah how can you that died to sin say it's okay to sin no you you cannot say that. So the problem is that our people need to understand this. Now, I don't know how many of you have the SDA commentary. But in one of the volumes, is either six or seven, I'm not sure. At the back of each volume, you have quotations from Ellen G. White on the passages that I mentioned. And Ellen G. White makes a statement on Romans 6 on, regarding baptism. And I'll paraphrase it. But the subtitle is Buried Alive. So look at the back. And go under the hiding, buried alive. And this is what she said. The reason why we have so many perplexities in our churches, and we do, is because our members have been baptized, but they were buried what? Alive. Therefore, they did not rise to newness of life in Christ, which is the Zoe life. You know? And uh, so it is important to understand that if you want to be delivered from the total problem of the sin problem you have to identify yourself with the death of what Christ when I first went to Ethiopia I was asked to take the week of prayer at the Ethiopian Adventist College and there was a young man there from Egypt his name was David who was taking mechanized agriculture and he was taught in the classroom I don't know who he, the teacher was but he was taught in the classroom that Christians do not carry arms and kill people that's why we are conscientious objectors. But the, his argument came primarily from Ellen G. White. So during the week of prayer, and I emphasize that we, we should always establish all our beliefs on the Bible and the Bible alone, I gave them time for questions. He stood up and he said, is it, can you prove from the Bible that it is a sin for a Christian to carry arms and kill people? And I said to him, I said, David, any Egyptian who does not fight for his country should be ashamed of himself. <laughs> he liked that. But then I asked him a question. Are you a Christian? He said, yes. Were you baptized into Christ? He said, yes. Then your Egyptian life died in Christ. And you received the life of Christ. And by the way, Christ was a Jew. <laughs> to tell an Arab that. He says, no way. So you, I said to him, I can give you many texts in the Bible, but let me give you one of them. I asked him to turn to Colossians chapter 3. A very clear statement. Colossians chapter 3. And listen to what Paul says to believers who are baptized into Christ. Colossians chapter 3. And look at verse 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. For you, you believers, you died. Have you got it? You what? And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Because you see, Egyptian students, when they graduate, they are required, compulsory, to do two years of military service, both men and women, and they have to carry arms and kill because they are you know the problem of the Middle East so when I read the text to him he said I don't care what the Bible says I'm not dead because he was very anti-Zionist uh, I said well then you're op not opposing me you're opposing the Word of God and you have to take you have to face that yourself so I left the week of prayer, went back to Addis Ababa, 150 miles away. And two weeks later, this young guy and his 
professor, the, the instructor who was an American, were testing a John Deere tractor that they had been working on. And our college up in the hill, and they were coming down this hill. The instructor was driving the tractor, David was sitting on the fender, and as they were coming down, the speed increased of the tractor, he put, the instructor put his leg on the brakes and nothing happened. There were no brakes. And so in his panic, he tried to slow down the tractor by moving it to a lower gear, <laughs> but those gears were not synchronized. It went into neutral and the speed increased. And he yelled at David, jump! And he jumped. Because there was a huge tree in front of them that the tractor was heading for. But David panicked and he held on to the fender and the tractor hit the tree and capsized and pinned him under. Well, to make a long story short, they rushed him to the hospital. Two doctors examined him and pronounced him dead. And the nurse brought the bachelor to cover his body and his head. And when she was covering his head, his eyes blinked. And she said, he's alive! So one of the doctors re-examined and found that he had revived. He was a faint heartbeat. So they called our headquarters and we had a mission plane. They flew the mission plane because the roads were terrible and picked him up and brought him to a hospital. He was unconscious for three weeks. And then he gained consciousness. So I went to visit him. He was bandaged from head to foot. The only thing that were open was his mouth, you know, and his eyes. And when I walked in, he smiled, so I knew he recognized me. And I bent very close to him and said, David, how are you? And I will never forget what he said. He said to me, David is dead. You're talking to a Christian. <laughs> he felt that God had to teach him the hard way. When he graduated, went back to Egypt, he refused to carry arms and he was deported. He's now in Sweden. Sweden accepted him, married to a Swedish girl. So folks, I hope God doesn't have to teach you the hard way, that in Christ you are dead. And your life is hid in who? Christ. But now, how is this the power of God unto salvation? Okay, number one, justification. Our, our death in Christ is essential for justification. First of all, you need to know what that word means. Okay, so if you turn to Deuteronomy, and we don't have time, to write it down. If you turn to Deuteronomy 25, and verse 1 and maybe 2, you will discover that if a person is brought, or people are brought to court, legal matter, the judge will justify the righteous and condemn the what? Wicked. So these two terms are legal terms. Justification is all for the righteous and condemnation is for the wicked. But you will discover that these this word justification has two applications. One is what I just mentioned in Deuteronomy 25, but I want to give you a second definition or application of the word justification. And I'm going to give you an illustration which is not true, folks. Please keep that in mind. While I'm here, I rob one of your banks. Washington Mutual. Okay, I robbed $10,000. And one of you guys report me, so I'm taken to court and I'm found guilty, and the judge sentenced me, as a condemned criminal, he sentenced me to five years in prison, which in America is not too bad, because you know, I worked in prison ministry. They feed them well, they have a TV, they have a gym, you can even study for a degree, all at the expense of our tax money. And so I spent five years in the in penitentiary, then I come out. Am I still condemned for that crime? Or do I come out a free man? Not because I did not commit the crime, but because I paid the price. Now the law of God doesn't put us in prison. The law of God says the soul that sins, it must what? Die. The wages of sin is what? Death. The moment you accept the death of Christ, the moment you identify yourself with the death of Christ, the law no longer condemns you. Romans 7 verse 1, the law has dominion over you only as long as you are alive. The moment you die, you are free. And verse 4 of Romans 7 says, we died in the body of Christ. And in baptism, 
you identify that. So baptism is really your funeral service. The pastor buries you because you have identified yourself with the death of Christ in the waters of baptism. But he can't keep you there even though he may want to. Because in exchange you receive the life of Christ. So you ra he raises you up with newness of what? Life. But look at Romans 6 which deals with baptism. Verse 3 to 8 is baptism. Look at verse 7 where Paul says he that is dead is freed from what? Look at the text. He that is dead, Romans 7, 6, Romans 6 verse 7, he that is dead is freed from what? From what? From sin. But the Greek word for freed is justified. Which is not wrong to say freed because justified means you're acquitted. So you read in Romans 6 verse 14, sin has no longer dominion over us because we are not under law but under what? Grace. Does it mean that you can sin? No, because look at verse 15. Shall we keep on sinning because you're not under law? And Paul says, God forbid. And then he gives the reason in the following verses. So our death is essential. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 11. Okay, you'll find this is the true saying. If we died with Christ, we shall what? Live with him. Romans 6 verse 8, the next verse after 7. We believe as Christians that if we died with Christ, we shall also what? Live with him. And I would love to read all the text, but I look at the clock and man, probation is closing. So please remember, our identification with the death of Christ has set us free from all the five categories of sin that we just looked at in the beginning. What about the other two? Sin is a power. Sin is a nature. Is our death to Christ, in Christ essential for sanctification? And the answer is yes. Remember, sin is a dual problem. Sin is what we do, but sin is also a law, a force in our members. When you accept your death in Christ, you are saying goodbye to the very source of your sin problem. When you say, I am crucified with Christ, you are accepting the death of your very nature. But now here's the problem. You are accepting your death in Christ only by faith. The reality took place in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.14, please write this down. When one died, we read it before, when one died, how many died? So the death of Christ was a corporate death. Yes, he did die in our place. He did die as a substitute. But what qualified him to do that? By uniting himself with our humanity. That's why he's called the second, or the Bible called him the last Adam. And Adam means mankind. So please remember that when you identify yourself with the death of Christ, you are lying the very source of your sin problem. I'm crucified with Christ, I'm living. It is not I, but who? Christ lives in. But please remember, you're dead only by faith. You still have that sinful nature. I wish it could go. But sorry, it won't go until Christ comes. And every day of your life, that sinful nature, that bios life, that ugly life that we were born with, keeps poking, poking his ugly head up. And you have to push him down by grace in Jesus Christ. And the worst form, the worst form of the flesh poking its ugly head up in your life is in the form of religion. The Pharisees were very religious. I thank you, God, I don't sin like the guy behind me. I fast twice a week. I give alms to the poor. I pay tithe. I thank you, God. I am a holy man. Now, I, I mentioned to you before, I'm not sure, it was this camp meeting, the last one, I was in Illinois. We have found, at least archaeologists have found, in some of the, many, the, some of the old 
manuscripts discovered in the Dead Sea Scroll, they have found the prayers of the Pharisees. Recorded. A Pharisee would get up in the morning, stand up before God, open his eyes, arms up, and he would say, thank you God, I was not born a Gentile. I was not born a dog. I was not born an ordinary Jew. I was not born, sorry for this, but that's what they said, I was not born a woman. I thank you God, I was born a Pharisee. And that word means somebody who is set aside only to obey all the rules of his church. The poor guy at the back said, God forgive me a sinner. Which of the two went home justified? The guy at the back. <laughs> the publican. So through the cross of Christ, we have a new nature now. We become partakers of the divine nature. But we have to learn to walk in the spirit. And that is a process. Tell me, do babies, are babies born with legs? When they learn to walk, do they fall? How many times? Have you mothers counted them? And after reaching 70 times 7, you say to the child, the next time you fall, you're out of the house. <laughs> you see, the, the blessing that we have in Christ is that he understands our struggle. He was tempted in how many points? Like whom? Like us. Now please, all points does not mean every temptation. He could not be tempted to watch, overwatch television. Okay? There are three basic drives under which all temptation comes under. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of what? And if you look at those three temptations in the wilderness, if you analyze them, they come under these three categories. Which sums up what Christ overcame in his 30 years of living on this earth. But folks, we must keep in mind that we need to learn to walk in the Spirit. And while we are learning, do we fall? How many times? Daily. Can Christ sympathize with our struggles? Hebrews 2 verse 18. He can sympathize because he knows our weakness. He can sympathize because he was tempted in all points. The only difference, he never sinned. Otherwise, we would be lost if he sinned. So thank God we have a perfect savior. Thank God he, we have been delivered from under law. So when the law comes to you and says, you better obey me, you say, find somebody else. I'm no longer your wife. I'm the wife of Jesus Christ. And that's found in Romans 7, 2 and 3. So my dear people, we have a gospel. We have a cross of Christ that is the power of God. It's foolishness to the un unsaved. But to us, Jews and Gentiles, it is the power of God unto what? Salvation. So it is my prayer that you will know this truth and the truth will set you what? Free. And as you learn to walk in the Spirit, the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus has already made us free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8 verse 2. So we have a savior that has taken care of every aspect of the sin problem. The only sin he did not die for is the sin of grace, against grace. The sin of unbelief. And I hope none of you ever commit that. Because I want to see you in heaven. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, every aspect of the sin problem in regards to your law has been dealt with. So that the law can no longer condemn us if we are in Christ by faith. But more than that, you have sent the spirit that gave Christ victory to dwell in us so that we might have the, the privilege to reflect your righteousness to a world groping in darkness. Help us, Lord. Teach us to walk in the Spirit as we grow in grace and truth. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.